So in the last video, we came up with a mathematical solution to describe the motion of our mass on the end of a spring, and we call that simple harmonic motion. So what we're going to do here is look at uh, various aspects of simple harmonic motion, and in particular, in this case, we're going to compare simple harmonic motion to uniform circular motion. Now, uniform circular motion is an object that is going round in a circle with a constant speed. The velocity is always changing because the direction changes as you go round in the circle, but the speed remains constant. And so what we have here is the ball on the end of an arm that will be made to rotate, and we're going to compare that motion, or at least one component, in here case the vertical component of that motion, to this ball which is attached to the end of a spring and is producing a mass spring system as we've seen before. So what we're going to do is I will turn this on and get this ball uh, moving and then I'll release this ball so that it oscillates up and down in sync. So here we have the system and they're both oscillating up and down and when you look at it through the camera you can see that the balls are moving up and down apparently in synchronization. However, if I turn this system around you can see what is actually going on. So this is the projection of the vertical motion. But here you can see that one of them is going round in a circle and the one on the end of the spring is going up and down vertically. So what this is showing is that circular motion or one component of circular motion is exactly the same as simple harmonic motion. And we can also use the position of this ball on the uh, rod that's going round in a circle to indicate the phase of the motion. If I draw a horizontal line in here that goes through the center of the circle, the angle between the rod which has the ball on the end of it and that horizontal line, that angle is a measure of the phase of the oscillation. And as you can see, the phase will go from zero all the way around to two pi as this ball completes one circuit of the motion. And that's how we can measure the phase of a simple harmonic oscillator using an angle. And it's why we have an alternative form of frequency. We talked about frequency. We also have the angular frequency, which of course is 2 pi times the regular frequency, and usually expressed in terms of radians per second. To understand this, let's have a look at the system in a little bit more detail on the computer. What we've got here is an object that's undergoing uniform circular motion. It's moving in a circular path with radius r, and it's moving with a constant speed v. What we're going to do is we're going to start timing when it crosses the x-axis and stop a time t later. And when we do that, we can see that it's moved through an arc of length s. And when we draw a line from the origin out to the final position of the object, we can see that we have an angle theta at the center. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. So here's the diagram we've got. We started our object at this position here, we ended it here, and it swept out this arc length s here. So if we look at the kinematics of the system, we've got the object has moved through a distance s in a time t, and it has a speed v. And the definition of speed is the distance moved, which is s, divided by time. So we have this relationship between the three of them that we can rewrite as s, the arc length, is equal to v times t. Now we can also look at this from a geometrical perspective. We've got a sector of a circle here, and our definition for an angle in radians, so here the angle being theta, the definition is it's the arc length s divided by the radius r. And so if we rearrange that, we get that the arc length is equal to r times theta. And then all we have to do is combine these two equations to get rid of this arc length uh, s, and we have v times t is equal to r times theta. And if we rearrange this, we have theta divided by t is equal to v divided by r. 
Now for uniform circular motion, where we have a constant circle of radius r and we're traveling at a constant speed v, this value here is a constant. And this is equal to the angle swept out by the object theta divided by the time. So this is the rate of sweeping out an angle, and by definition in physics we call this the angular velocity of an object moving in a circular path, and we write this with the Greek letter omega. And it has units, since it's an angle per second, it's units of radians per second. So this is the angular velocity, and for a uniform circular motion, omega here is a constant value. So what that means is we can write this angle here, theta, as just omega times the time. So we now have an expression for this angle, which we refer to as the phase of the object, as the angular velocity omega multiplied by the time t. But supposing instead of taking the zero time when the object crossed the x-axis, we'd taken it at some arbitrary other point around the circle, say for example here. Well in that case, we'd have a slightly different diagram. So here's the diagram we get. Our initial position now is not on the x-axis, it's at some distance from it, and this could be anywhere on the circle. And we have an angle phi between our initial position and the positive direction of the x-axis. Now, this total angle here between where the object is after a time t and the x-axis is now, this angle theta that we called before, is now equal to omega t plus phi. The reason for that is, although we start at an angle phi, this is what we call our initial uh, phase, we still increase at a rate of omega t. The angular velocity is constant, it's, it's equal to omega, and we increase at omega t. So the total phase is omega t plus phi. And we can use this total phase to calculate the x and y coordinates. If I draw in a right angle triangle here, then we can see that the length of this side here, remember we've got a circle of radius r, so the length of this side of our right angle triangle is r, and then we're closing the angle down here, so it's r cosine theta, and theta is just equal to omega t plus phi, so this is our x coordinate, and here, for our y coordinate, here we're closing the angle to get this one, we're opening the angle, and so this is r sine, and then omega t plus phi. And so we can write our x and y coordinates of this object in terms of the sine or cosine of omega times t, where omega is the angular velocity, and phi is the initial phase which is determined by whenever we start uh, timing, uh, or whenever we define t equals zero. So here we are back at the animator diagram, and we're going to look at the y component for the object undergoing circular motion. Now we're going to start our timing when the object is on the x-axis, so we're going to have a zero initial phase in this case, and so our y component is just r times the sine of omega t, as we already derived. Now, we want to compare this to an oscillator, and when we wrote down our solution for the oscillator, we used cosine, so we want to switch our y component here into a cosine term, and to do that, we're going to use the trig identity that the sine of theta is equal to the cosine of theta minus pi over 2, and when we do that, we see that our y coordinate becomes r times the cosine of omega t minus pi over 2. So now let's add in our oscillator, our mass on the end of a spring. And as we can see from this, when we put this in, we're going to be starting with a zero initial phase for the oscillator and a randomly chosen amplitude. And when we draw a line between the object going around in a circle and the mass on the end of the spring, we can see that we've got, they're all over the place, there's no nice synchronization between the two. Now the reason for that is, is because if we look at the y-coordinate for the object going around in a circle, we can see that it has an initial phase of minus pi over 2, whereas our oscillator on the end of the uh, spring has an initial phase of 0. So what we need to do first is we need to bring the initial phases to be equal to one another, so we need to decrease the initial phase from 0 down to minus pi over 2. 
Now that we've done that, we can see that the two things are moving in synchronization. So our mass on the end of the spring, it's at its maximum displacement from the equilibrium when the object going around in a circle is at its maximum y value, and vice versa. When we have the minimum displacement or the most below the line, then we also have the object and the circle at the most negative y value for its uh, coordinate. However, we still don't have them um, moving uh, together. The reason for that is that the amplitudes are not the same. We started with an initial amplitude of about a third of the radius of the circle, and this is not enough. We don't get enough uh, uh, movement from the mass on the end of the spring, so we need to increase the amplitude up to being equal to the uh, object going around in a circle. Now, the one thing we haven't discussed here, the other parameter, is the frequency of the motion. Now, in this case, it's because it's difficult to animate different frequencies. However, what we've done is we've set these equal to, we've set these equal to, in this case, what we've said is that the angular frequency of the object on the end of the spring is equal to the angular velocity of the object going around in a circle. And if those were different, we would have, the, the two objects would really be all over the place. But now we have the oscillator with an amplitude equal to the radius and an initial phase that's equal to minus pi over 2. We can see that we've got the two objects oscillating perfectly in phase and undergoing the same amplitude of motion. And so what we're showing here is that simple harmonic motion is really just a one-dimensional projection for an object that is going around in a circle. And that was the demonstration we started with. Now here we have a setup that does the reverse of what we've seen with comparing circular motion to an oscillator. It takes two oscillators and it produces a circle. So this is an oscilloscope where these are hooked up, each the X and the Y displacements are hooked up to two signal generators that generate sine waves. And when we put them together in the correct phase between the two, we end up with a perfect circle. However, if I start this uh, triggering again, you can see that the phase changes and the shape varies between a line uh, going to a circle and then back to a line in the other diagonal and with being an ellipse in between. And so that shows the effect of having a phase difference between these two signals that go in. You know, we end up with not necessarily with a circle, but we can generate lines or ellipses. And more interestingly, we can also double the frequency or triple the frequency of one of them. And this generates a whole series of images that are called Lizajou figures. So we've now taken a uniform circular motion and shown how it's equal uh, and equivalent to a simple harmonic oscillator in one dimension. And we've done the reverse. We've taken simple harmonic oscillators and recreated circular motion and, and indeed much more.